Suppose you came to me and I had two glasses in my hand. One is a glass of tomato juice. I changed that. One is a glass of dirty water. The other is a milkshake. How many of you would choose the dirty water, kids? No, it's water. Water's good for you. Ah, but it may have some things mixed in that might not be so great, right? Okay. A shake probably isn't the best for you, but it's okay to enjoy one now and then. It tastes better. It's colder, refreshes more. All right, kids, that's my children's story for today. It's short and brief, but I want you to keep that in mind, and we'll let the adults keep that in mind as we go into the sermon, okay? All right. So, I want to begin with the word of grace. You have been separated to the gospel of God. That gospel which concerns his son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This book, this book is incredibly awesome. It is God's self-revelation not just to those who believe, but it's self-revelation to all. It is so simple, a child can get the important stuff from it. They can understand some basic stuff, right? It is so deep that the brightest mind in the world ponders over its complexities. And yet, there is always, always time for us to gain fresh insights even in very familiar, even in very loved passages. One of my most helpful Bible study tools is a very simple thing. It's to say, God, why is this here? I I'm serious about that. When I come across a, a, a very difficult passage, I say, God, why is this here? If I come across something that seems contradictory to something else, I say, God, why is this here? And I pause. And sometimes I don't get an answer right away, and sometimes I do. And sometimes I just have to think about it. And maybe look up other texts that deal with that topic. Today, I want to share with you what may be a new understanding of, of one of the emblems of the Lord's Supper today. We usually focus on two elements, as we should. We focus on the bread as a symbol of his body, and we focus on the wine as a symbol of his shed blood. As I was preparing for a communion service not too terribly long ago, so this is a reworked sermon, I admit it. As I was preparing for this, this communion sermon not too long ago, I decided I was going to read all three synoptic gospels to, to compare them to what they said about the communion service. And as I did, I, I observed something I had not noticed before. I noticed not just what Jesus said, but I noticed what Jesus did not say. Jesus told them to take the cup. That's what he said. He did not say, take the cup of wine. He did not say, take the cup with the wine in it that is to be a symbol of my blood shed. He didn't mention that. And so I was figuratively scratching my head, why would he refer to the cup and not to what was in the cup? And maybe it's just a simple thing, you know, you can't say he took the wine. Maybe it's just so simple that he took the cup and you would understand that it's in the wine, but that just didn't seem to set right with me. It, it seemed like there had to be something more. And so I was impressed to, to look up every single time in the Bible 
the word cup appeared. Computer Bibles are, are handy for that kind of thing. And so I, I looked them up and I discovered there's over 70 times the word cup and or cups are referred to. Most of the time they're referring to literal cups like Joseph's cup. But there were over 25 times when it refers to the cup of God's wrath or something that goes along with the cup of God's wrath. 25 times. Now before I go any farther, before I go any farther, I, I, I want you to, to recognize, I want you to recognize that God's wrath is a di very difficult topic. I think I fast forward to someone, Sabrina, so catch up. It's not your fault. God's wrath is a difficult topic. People have pondered over it for years, for centuries. How can a God who is a God of love also be a God of wrath? And so let, let me give you a definition of God's wrath. God's wrath is a holy reaction to the woe and misery resulting from rebellion against himself and his principles. This is a quote from George Knight. From that perspective, divine wrath is not an opposition to God's love, but rather a natural fruit of it. God cannot and will not stand by while his creatures suffer. When you say, but there's suffering in the world all the time, I think it's talking about sometimes now, but also ultimately. You and I, when we hear of terrible tragedies and atrocities in the world around us, we shake our heads and, and we get angry. We get angry when we hear of a child who's been molested or a child who's been abused, don't we? Why wouldn't a God of love do the same? And we, we do that for even children we don't even know. Why wouldn't a God of love do the same? God, God's wrath is not a, a, a vengeful wrath. God's wrath is not a get back at you wrath. It's simply a reaction against a reaction against sin and all of sin's effects. Let me, let me give you a, a quote from the Bible. Okay? Jeremiah 25 verses 15 to 16. As one example of the cup used as a symbol of wrath. Thus the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me, take from my hand this cup of the wine of wrath and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. They shall drink and stagger and be crazed because of the sword I am sending among them. And of course, the book of Revelation picks up this, this symbol of the cup of wrath several times. And so you can't say it's just an Old Testament concept. It's found in the very last book of the Bible. The concept of the wrath of God is not an easy one. We cannot easily reconcile it together. But we need to understand that without the wrath of God, there would be no need for the cross of Christ. Jesus' death would not be necessary. Now, some people focus on Romans chapter 1, and they talk about the fact that Paul said in Romans that those who sin, that God will abandon them to their sinful ways. And so they talk about God's wrath as, and, and it's a valid point. They talk about God's wrath as simply God removing his protection and people facing the consequences of their own actions. And that's true, is it not? So if I lie to you and you find out the lie I told you, the consequences I will face is that you will no longer trust me as much, correct? Correct? There are consequences to action. And sometimes God even protects us when we do things we shouldn't or don't do things we should. And so that's a very valid point. But some people take it maybe a little farther than I would. And they say that that's the only thing there is to God's wrath. He simply removes his protection and we face the consequences. But I believe that's not adequate. Because I believe that there are too many examples in the Bible of God's righteous anger against sin. I'll give you two. In the story of Noah's Ark, God said, I will send the rain. He didn't say the rain will show up as it 
would have otherwise. He says, I'm going to send it to destroy the world. Because he looked around and all he saw was wickedness. Remember the story? Let me give you another example. A New Testament one. When Jesus was in the temple and the money changers were there in the temple and they were robbing people and they were extorting people for religious purposes, for their own gain, Jesus threw the, 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 the tables over and cast them out in anger. That was an action on Jesus' part. You see, I, I think there are two kinds of, two ways to look at God's wrath. There is one way in which it's a passive wrath. He withdraws his protection and we face the consequences. There is another way in which, yes, we face the consequences, but God is active, involved in what those consequences might be. I cannot read the Old Testament and the New Testament without seeing that. God's wrath is not something we want to look forward to. It's not something we want to endure. But I'm thankful that the Bible portrays God as a God of love who does not want to do his strange act at the end of time. I, I would remind you of John 3.17. You know 3.16. For God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's God's goal for you, for me, in fact, for the world. And so, as I thought about that, as I thought about the fact that God's wrath, the cup, symbolizes God's wrath. But there's something else that the cup symbolizes. Five times in the Bible, it refers to the cup of blessing. That very familiar passage in Psalm 23. He, he, he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and staff comfort me. There's some discipline there. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My what? My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. How long? Forever. The cup of blessing. The, the cup of blessing is a symbol in the Bible as well. What's really interesting is, remember, Jesus gave and instituted the Lord's Supper after, after the Passover. And the Passover had four cups. Sometimes they used one cup and just kept pouring in for, for the next drink, okay? But at the beginning, there was a cup that symbolized sanctification. Now, that's not sanctification in terms of cleansing. That's sanctification in terms of God setting apart Israel for himself. And so that first cup that they would drink at the beginning of the Passover feast was, was a cup of, of, of separation, knowing they belonged to God. What a great place to start, right? The second cup was the cup of the plagues or the cup of God's judgment against those who rebelled. The third cup was the cup of redemption, and it was also called the cup of, guess what? Cup of what? Blessing. You can say it. And then the fourth cup was the cup of praise, or it was also called the cup of acceptance. And so in those four cups, you, you have both the second cup, which was the cup of God's wrath, basically, and you also had the cup of blessing, which was the cup of acceptance as well. So as, we, as I thought about these two cups, as I, as I thought about them, it was interesting to me, as I thought about the fact that Jesus took the cup, and it does not mention the wine, I asked why, it came to me that Jesus took the cup of wrath 
so that you and I can take the cup of blessing. What does that do for you? It sent chills up and down my spine. Jesus took the cup of wrath so that we can take the cup of blessing. I'm not quite there yet. Okay, thank you. I, I just want to point out something. In the cup, there is the blood of Jesus symbolized, right? The atoning blood of Christ. That's what makes every blessing we receive possible. Every single blessing we receive possible. And so today as we celebrate the communion service, we have an option. Do you want to receive the cup of wrath because of re rebellion, choosing to live your own life, your own way? Maybe even being religious without knowing Jesus, knowing all the doctrines, and we should, but it's possible to know the doctrines without knowing Jesus because in his prayer in John 17, Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. If you're trying to be religious without knowing Jesus, without knowing God, it'll end up in failure. Do you want to receive the cup of wrath or do you want to receive the cup of blessing? Let me, let me put it another way, okay? Just follow me on the screen. Jesus took the cup of God's wrath against sin so that he could give you the cup of pardon. I didn't hear a single amen. amen. Jesus took the cup of your curse so that he could give you the cup of God's blessing. Amen. Jesus took the cup of your guilt so that he could give you the cup of his peace. Amen. Jesus took the cup of your separation from God so that he could give you the cup of reconciliation with God. Jesus took the cup of your sorrow that he could give you the cup of joy. Jesus took the cup of God's wrath against sin so that, he, no, next slide. Jesus took the cup of your suffering so that he could give you the cup of comfort. Jesus took the cup of your abandonment by God so that he could give you the cup of God's presence with you. Jesus took the cup of your shame so that he could give you the cup of glory. And Jesus took the cup of your second death so that he could give you the cup of eternal life. Amen. This morning, almost afternoon by the time we get there, we will have the opportunity to take part of the symbols. Since that day I discovered this, I think there is a twofold symbol in the cup. The cup that holds the cup, the blessing, and the wine that provides the blessing. This morning, we will have a foot washing service for those who choose to participate, which has a dual purpose as well. It is to be a symbol of our willingness to serve one another, and it's also to be a symbol of a re-cleansing of our lives, a, a miniature re-baptism, if you will. Because I don't know about you, but my feet get dirty as I travel along this evil world. And I forgot to check on this, so somebody help me out. Cup, couples are in the fa family room, men are in the community services room, and women are in the Sabbath school room. Thank you, that's the one I couldn't remember. We'll separate this time. If you choose not to do that, you may remain here. There will be music. Please don't leave. Jesus invites you to this meal in his honor. Please stay by. May God bless us.